We are live. <clears> hey. <throat> okay. Is that working? I think so. Is that working? Is on? Is thing on? <laughs> uh, yeah. So I, as you can see, I'm not in my regular, my regular location. I'm in a, uh, I'm in a guest house in Tucson, Arizona. Oh, excellent. Yeah, yeah. So we are, we are frying being snowbirds <laughs> for, the, for the for the winter. Not for the whole winter, for a month. And so we've uh, we've rented a little house in Tucson, and we are. <clears throat> my audio is too low, apparently. I have oh, no control over that's it. fixable. Totally fixable. Yeah. As long as this is my audio. I think that that's what you were. That yeah. Okay. You were at 100. I'm putting you back up to 120. Okay. Now you should be fine. Yeah. And I have, like I said, I have no control. I've got, I've got maximum gain on the microphone and, and I have no other control. Um, yeah. So we're, we're just seeing what it's like to live in a place that isn't cold, wet, and rainy for, um, for a month. And if we like that, then we'll try another place that's not cold and wet and rainy. But I got to say, uh, the U.S. has the worst internet. Poor, <laughs> poor people. <laughs> it's funny. Cause, cause like, I, you know, I, my editor, you know, is in Europe. Um, yeah. Chad often is working from the road or is in like random coffee shops yeah. and the worst internet I've ever experienced is in the United States. Uh -huh. It's like, I don't know whether it's like the place is big or you just have like these, these terrible internet providers that lock you into some kind of monomaniacal, um, monopoly, that, but that's, yeah, yeah, it's rough. And so, you know, I'm, and so I, I brought the Starlink. And I put it in the roaming mode, so now I can mm -hmm. roam with it. I can set it up wherever I go. But the problem is the more populated you are in an area, the worse Starlink becomes. Right, right. And, and so, you know, yeah, if I was in the middle of the Sonoran Desert, then maybe <laughs> I would have really good internet. But because I'm close to a city, I have <sighs> bad internet. And, and then, but I'm far enough out of a city that the internet providers are just completely unwilling to provide fast internet to the to our hosts so yeah and so i've been struggling through trying to make people work <clears throat> it's pretty it funny is what it is yeah exactly yeah but uh and so i'm right now i'm on starlink and if it really botches i can switch over to the to the regular internet that they have here um but yeah, so I'm you're going back to canada for christmas but you're there for a month I'm, <laughs> um yeah we're here till the 15th of December, and then we're going to drive back and we're going to go to a bunch of places up the coast. So I'm going to awesome. try to go to JPL yeah. and visit some friends in San Francisco and family in Portland and so on. But yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Um, and we did that sort of coming down. So I, I <clears throat> visited with um, Brian Dunning. And, and Richard, Richard Saunders, Saunders was be, there. And Richard Saunders was there. That so was that was amazing. great. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It was super fun to hang out with them. I was totally and, jealous. Uh, and hopefully I'll be able to hit up a bunch of interesting places here. Like Biosphere 2 is here. The Mirror yeah, Lab is here. Yeah. So there's a lot of places that I want to go. Uh, Mount Lemon Observatory is here. Yep. So there's a lot of stuff that I'd like to go and see if I can. Large binocular um, telescope would be super cool to have good pictures of. Is it here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, there you go. So I've, I've just got to <laughs> sort of coordinate. I need a producer to coordinate this stuff but anyway <laughs> but it is funny i'm definitely getting cultural sh culture shock living in the united states and i understand you better now i think um and i've only been here for a week not even a week i've been here for four days but there is a kind of you don't understand this like i don't think you realize this but I sort of have perceived this from afar uh -huh. and the international audience will agree with me on this, that it is so easy to have every wish fulfilled in the United States that you are completely accustomed to it. And you don't even realize that like I needed a part for the, I'm missing one part to try and I'm going to try and make the connection a little bit better. I'm going to get a, a dongle that'll connect my, 
through wired to an Ethernet port so that I can get like the best possible connection to the internet. Right, right. And I'm like, well, I'm just going to Amazon. I'm going to order it. Okay, great. You know, and it was like, uh, it's going to come today at five. I'm like, wait, what? How? Huh? Like, like the same day uh -huh. that I choose to order the thing, the thing will arrive and I don't have to leave my house. What world is this? One like, without what health I was care. You can I either so. have Should same maybe. day or health care. I would care, gladly, yeah. I, <laughs> I sure have $4,000 in bills from having my gallbladder removed and mm. I have health insurance and yeah, I that's... still have that many bills. I, I so would, that would be free. We just wouldn't get it for three, you know, but, but I would have to make all kinds of compromises and, uh, and so it's funny. My... I will take oh, your right. internet and lack of streaming the same movies for health care. Yeah. If you can pay for it, then it all happens instantaneously. Like, so, so for example, that gallbladder surgery uh -huh. would have taken about four or five years before you could get it in Canada because it's non life threatening. So yeah. that's the difference is, is that everything in Canada is about sort of like waiting, making do compromising, making difficult decisions. Uh, just sort of really thinking through how badly do you want this thing? Are you willing to repair this thing? Make do with it longer. Like there's just this. And and like our hosts are just like, they just, ha they, things magically appear, right? It's just some, it's the weirdest thing. It's the weirdest feeling. To just, and we were in the, like the grocery stores. Costco is three times bigger. Yes. And it's just everything you want. You want do you want eggs? No problem. Do you want hard boiled eggs in a that you could just eat? They're there. Like it just it's amazing. It's crazy. It's weird. Uh yeah, it's um it's overwhelming to to sort of experience the the American uh lifestyle. It's and funny. the portion sizes. Yeah, I mean we've been pretty I mean, we because we're eating vegetarian or vegan. Yeah, you know, sort of, we're having a hard time finding good restaurants. We, there's a couple though that are just amazing. Like, like the whole place is is a full menu that's all vegan and it's all that's so awesome. good. So yeah, it was great. It was in that was in uh, Las Vegas actually, in Henderson. We just had like the best vegan restaurant and we just ate like idiots. <laughs> there were so many choices. It was great. Uh, so yeah. Anyway, it's weird. It's weird. Yeah, I'm enjoying the culture shock, um, but I am definitely experiencing the culture shock living in your country for a few weeks <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, it, and it answers a lot of questions to me about sort of the way you perceive the world which is funny because you can make problems go away if you have the money you can make problems go away but where i live even if you have money you can't make problems go away like they just they require compromises they require uh, i'll give you one last sort of anecdote before we move on but you know my wife is constantly ordering stuff from the US into Canada. And each time it is just a struggle to go through the, uh, you know, all of the regulations and all of the border patrol issues and all of the customs and handling and fees and time delays. Things just end up in someone's, I don't know, cupboard for a month because that's what happens. Mm -hmm. And yet she just keeps going like, I've got to. I've got to be able to get this thing from this place and I've ordered it and it should all have happened. Right. And you know, the Canadian knows like, no, that's not how this works. Like, like you only order things that are inside Canada. So that hassle has already been gone through. Then you can, but you're good, but you have to accept a limited section of the things that you want. Welcome but to end will... stage capitalism. Yeah. Yeah. That, and I, I, that's what it is that I am experiencing end stage capitalism uh -huh. for for both the good and the the horrors of it, and uh, yeah, it's a it's a very interesting experience. Yeah. Anyway, that's it. I just wanted to you know, I like I know as a I sound I don't know, I have an accent that's very similar to you. I have a very similar kind of cultural experience, but there's ju it's just it's just weird to be here. Anyway, that's it. Yeah, yeah. I still. Four thousand dollars for a gallbladder removal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, totally. But you got it done as soon as you needed, as soon as you wanted. 
I'm going right. to be paying for it as long as I would have been waiting for it in Canada. Sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. As you said, end stage capitalism, right? If you, could, if you could afford it, you can have it with a snap of, a, of your fingers. And, and, and in Canada, even if you could pay for it, you can't. Well, and here it wasn't a matter of paying. It wasn't a matter of because I had money, they just do gallbladder surgeries that rapidly. Like I had to wait three months and everyone thought that was un uncalled for. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my wife had to get shoulder surgery and she like it popped into her mind that it was a thing she was going to do while we were, we were in the U.S. Well, yeah. When yeah. she was living in the U.S. And then she had it done within three days. Yeah. Just like, what? No, that's that's that is years. Kuwait. <laughs> no. Anyway, all right, let's uh, let's move on. Okay, with, uh, right. where is my recording software? There it is. <laughs> John Seville, Canada, USA. Do you have an, any guns? No. Okay, you can go through USA to Canada. Do you have any guns? No. Do you want to buy some? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. They were. I, they, I was surprised they let us in with no guns. Um. All right. We're episode what number? Six ninety nine. Six ninety nine. And the thing you can't see is I've got the I've got pillows and blankets all around me in this room <laughs> to try the, and damp the echoes. It's a very echoey room, and so I've just yeah I've turned this into my own uh, bouncy castle. I yeah. love it. I, I did you yeah. bring the doggo with you? Wait, you lost the doggo, no. didn't you? Yeah, we did not bring the dog. I'm s okay. That would have been morbid. I'm sorry. I, no I I forgot for a moment. Mistakes were, we're made. We're here because we have no dog. We're here. We're able to make this trip because we have no dog. And the plants got enough mealy bugs that Pamela was willing to, uh, sorry, the, the Carla, see? The, the Carla was willing to, uh, to put them all out in the compost. All so. right. All right. Let's I'm going to press record. All okay, right, it's pressed. recording. Pressing record on the video. It's recording. Okay. We are recording. All right, here we go. A Astronomy Cast, episode 699, our holiday gift guide. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of the universe today. With me, as always, is Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the direct plasma quest. Hey, Pamela, how you doing? I, I'm doing well, but I have to admit, I, I am not emotionally prepared for this episode. My Halloween decorations are still in the yard. I have not done my grocery shopping. It is still September in my head. <laughs> Good right. Lord, how did we get here? Yeah, yeah. I mean, one time marches inexorably on also you know we are getting ahead of you know we're recording this show it won't trip for another week that'll be like just after your thanksgiving and i feel like after you finish your thanksgiving that is the moment where in your mind christmas and the holiday season starts to loom large so it, i think it's the time yeah. is all fine yeah saturday yeah. is making tamales out of leftovers and putting up christmas decorations that sounds good I need to warn people, I'm not in my typical studio. I'm on the road. I'm recording with less wonderful recording equipment. So, but hopefully it still sounds okay. You still sound um, good. And yeah, it'll be, I'm using a cool little gadget. I'm using a DJI uh, microphone system and I, I really like it actually. Very simple. Um, and Excellent. I'll be here for the next four weeks. So just, I apologize in advance, uh, but this is going to be my reality right now. <laughs> Hopefully it's not too bad. So just a warning, holidays are rapidly approaching. It's time once again to think about what to buy all the space nerds on your list. Here's what we like, and we'll talk about it in a second, but it is time for a break. And we're back. All right, we do this every year, but like things always remain the same as well. So do we want to talk about the things that will always remain the same or do we want well, the things that are new that we like. So I I decided to add things like board games this year. And mm -hmm. there are a bunch of new books, not all of which I have read, but many of which are on the list today because 
I want someone to buy them for me. Oh, right. Okay. Wait and a minute. Is that, is that what today is? <clears throat> today is a holiday list for Pamela? Well, it, at least with, with a, a couple of the very few, very few things. But it does okay, happen. Okay. Yep. All right. Um, well, let's let's just start. I mean, where do you want to start? Do you want to start with games? Do you want to start with, with uh, books, movies, uh, gear? Let's let's what start do, with gear start? because let's let's just get that out of the way and right. and go for what we need to. Okay, so if you have a person in your life that is wanting to get into astronomy, what do we always recommend as the first piece of reasonably inexpensive kit that you should acquire? Binoculars. Binoculars. Yeah. Um, well, do you have any opinions? So uh, I guess there's like three classes of this, right? There's like nice, small traveling binoculars. Yeah. There's good astronomical binoculars. And then there is the Cadillac of binoculars. So, um, so uh, we'll start with the traveling ones, you know, like any binoculars work great. Yes. Beyond no binoculars and looking for those two numbers, eight times 35, seven times 35. 10 by 50. Ideally, 10 by 50. Ideally, maximize the second number and don't be so concerned about the first number. The first number is the magnification. So it's like seven times, it's eight times, it's 10 times. Don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. <laughs> the second number, though, is the size of the eyepiece in or the size of the aperture Light in gathering. millimeters. And that's the amount of light that it's getting gathered. The more light that you gather, the fainter the objects you're going to be able to see. You want that number to be bigger. So, but they're all kind of the same. So, eight by seven by thirty fives, eight so, by fifty, ten by fifty. So whatever what, is like a nice size small. Yeah. Yeah. Right. What I usually look for is a field of view that's a couple of degrees, because that makes star hopping super easy. And then maximize the the uh, size of the front end as big as I can afford first. Don't buy something you can't afford. And second, as big as I can hold study with my hands. There, there are times when it's amazing to have giant binoculars that require a tripod or require you to be laying down and like balancing them with your elbows on the ground. But most of the time, you just want something that you can carry out into your backyard and just look up while in a hammock. Yeah. And you shouldn't be spending more than 50 bucks for this. Like, they're reasonably inexpensive. But if you want to spend more on a pair of binoculars and you do want that one that's going to give you a better view, yeah. then you want to go to the astronomical binoculars. And those will have numbers like 25 times 75. Uh, 15 by 75 or 25 times by 100. And so 100 millimeter, 75 millimeter lenses with higher magnification. And they're amazing. Like yes. they're, you fall into the sky. It's the power is incredible, but they're heavy. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a good way to figure out whether or not you have small muscle trembles and build up your <laughs> Uh, ability to hold things like, in that like bucket at arm's length challenge that's what giant yeah. binoculars yeah, and if, are and if you are willing you know if you've got like, a nice spot that you can sit lay back you've got some some tripod that can hold the binoculars. they come with a nice tripod holder often or try you know they have a tripod mount yeah put them on a tripod and yeah then exactly you can use them and you don't have to hold them and jiggle them but the cadillac of these are the image stabilizing binoculars Yes, these you're you're looking sometimes upwards of a thousand dollars, but the nice thing about them is some of the fanciest ones can even snap images inside of their electronics, which is kind of wild. But Whoa. yeah, yeah, but you can be <laughs> you can be in a windy circumstance. You can be on a boat. Uh, they tolerate all sorts of weird environmental issues and just regular everyday my yeah. hands shake. No big deal. And allow your eyes to just take in those photons and show you the nebulae. 
and I mean, we're a lot more experienced with this kind of thing. Like when you when you take video with your say iPhone, or, you know, yeah, or you've got like a, a nice little DSLR that's got some kind of image stabilization built in. That's what it's like. You are yeah. you are looking at the sky, and then you press the image stabilization button, and then the sky just it turns into a photograph in your vision, and not but you you know things can be happening, but it is rock solid. Yeah, and that makes everything. And it's hard to undersell how wonderful that kind of thing is. Um, but these are expensive. I mean, you're looking at upwards of a thousand bucks for a pair of image stabilizing binoculars. They, even bigger ones can be more expensive. Yeah. But they are glorious. And so if you really want to impress the pants off of somebody, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I highly recommend, you know, if you want to, if you got something really special to buy for someone who, who's really going to be into this, and they they really will do the heavy lifting. You can look at birds. You can see stuff at night, space. Yeah. I mean, they're just great. And One of the things you want to look for if you're using them for astronomy is to make sure they have an anti-reflective overcoat. When you're birding, there's a whole lot of daylight, so you don't worry about it. So if you're buying them and they are designed for bird watching, they're not going to be as good at night because they reflect a significant portion of the light that's hitting those giant apertures. And the giant apertures, what good is it to have a giant aperture if the lens is just gonna reflect the light? But those overcoatings allow the light to go through the lens instead of getting reflected off of it. Yeah. All right, we're gonna talk about this some more, but it's time for another break. <clears throat> and we're back. All right, let's talk about telescopes. Okay. Dobsonians, right. so if you want to use your answer. eyeballs, and yep. uh, a simple Schmidt cast if you want to start astrophotography. Um, I'm going to replace that recommendation. Really? Yeah, yeah. So, are you going to so like a unistellar or something? Yeah, yeah. So I'm 100 percent going to agree with you. Like, yeah. If you want to get into astronomy, you don't want to spend too much money. You want a nice light bucket. You want a Dobsonian get a six inch or an eight inch mm -hmm. six inches fine eight inches yeah. is great eight inch is too much don't be it's too hard to, to move bigger. so you won't use yeah. it yep um and it's simple easy to use with a nice finder once you learn the sky you can look around very quickly and find what you're looking for yeah um i would have agreed with you for the like the next step with a with an automatic like with a with a schmick cast with a you know, with a camera on board. Yeah, yeah. But I, but I don't recommend that anymore. Um, okay. Because they are still very complicated to use. Yes. They do take very nice, but the polar alignment on them, it just takes so long. And at the end of the day, you, you're not looking to spend the $10,000. You're going to spend a few thousand dollars to get that set up. And it's going to not be good enough for what you want. And so I think if you're going to want something that's not good enough for what you want as well, um, <laughs> I recommend automated telescopes. So uh, both Unistellar and Veonis make these. They are, you know, I'm not going to lie, they're three to four thousand dollars, but they are idiot proof. You take this thing outside, you set it down with a clear view of the night sky, you turn it on, it finds its way around the sky, recognizes where it is, and then you just say let's take pictures of Andromeda and it just turns to Andromeda and just starts taking pictures. I, I will net. add the caveat that I tried using one of the Veonis ones that, that I had to do reviews and it was so bitterly cold here that the telescope was like, I shall not, I right. will um, not. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if they've sort of what the temperature ranges are, but minus is 10 how... was not. Right. <laughs> so, but that seems really really civilized right because you take the thing you put it outside you get back inside and then you're just controlling it with your phone and you're taking pictures well and that's what i tried to do and it said no i'm not yeah. going to so right. so just yeah. have okay. the caveat that in my personal experience with them they prefer yeah. to be warmer than not right um, well we don't know i mean who knows that could have been that model could have been the battery who knows um and batteries but, in general don't like being minus 10. And they yeah, are exactly. battery driven. Yep. Um, and so just, you know, you always say like the cam, the best camera is the one you're going to use. Yeah, exactly. Like if you've ever, if you've had any kind of telescope that has a, a automated drive on it, 
and you go outside and you tell your friends, oh, Jupiter's up. Let's go look, look at Jupiter. And then you, just a second. I just wait a second. I can't seem to get it. Hold on a minute. And then, yeah. you know, your friends are packing up their cars and they're going home. You're like, oh, just a second. And then finally, three hours later, you finally polar aligned it. Like it's, if you know what you're doing yeah. and you're really comfortable with the telescope and it's in a place where you know, and you've gone through the, the polar alignment process hundreds of times, then sure. Yeah. Yeah. Go that route. Or you don't care. I will often carry my refractor right. out to the sidewalk to show things to my neighbor's kids. Yep. No polar alignment meant I am using right. a 20 millimeter Plasso lens, a so big field of view. I point the telescope and I just constantly adjust it. And, and but that's, that's your Dobsonian. Like that's what the no, Dobsonian will get you. Well, and that's, and it just happens to be, I have the refractor. Right. So yeah, I'm treating yeah, my so refractor like a Dobsonian. Right, exactly. So if you if you want the really quick, let's see what's up in the sky. Oh, look, the moon looks really nice tonight. That's your double If yeah, you want to yeah. start getting into astrophotography, and I say start because it is the beginning of the rabbit hole, then these yeah. automated telescopes are great. But, you know, and we're not going to make this sort of holiday recommendation for you to go out and spend $10,000 in a proper no, astrophotography no. rig. But you will get to a point where that's the kind of gear that you're going to want to buy to do the kind of astrophotography that you've become accustomed to seeing. And so what these automated telescopes do is they get you there fast. And I, and I, I think that's worth so much. And so if you're, if you're the kind of person that wants to get into astrophotography, you don't want a lot of time to mess around and you yeah. want to just get results. These things are, are there. And Unistellar has a super cool collaboration with the SETI Institute to do a yep. variety of citizen science projects. Yeah, you can so, do science yeah. with these telescopes. Yeah. Great. It's pretty cool. So, yep. All right. Uh, let's actually we're gonna do one more break and then we'll move on with other recommendations. And we're back. All right. So now we'll move into where do you want to go now? Do you want to go games? Do you want to go books? Do you want to go? I, what do you want to do? I want to start by recommending a truly silly, uh, makes you think and not entirely scientific game, but it's simply a pure delight to play. And this game is called Abduction, A-B-D-U-C-K, uh, -A as in little rubber duckies. And the idea is that you're a scientist developing technology to travel through space and your test subjects are these ducks that do not get hurt during the process. And your goal is to get your ducks to align into different configurations, inclu including like the constellation Cassiopeia, Orion's Belt. It is a delight. It's a pattern map matching game that requires a fair amount of strategy but it is also luck based because you have a silicon ufo that all the little rubber duckies go in and you pull the pieces out and you don't know what you're going to get and you have to align them by colors and patterns on the cosmic flow stream and it, this is a physical board game it's a physical board game it wow. is truly delightful and you're playing with little tiny rubber ducks and a UFO. It's oh, amazing. Fun. It's amazing. They're not a sponsor of this show. They could be. <laughs> no, nothing Nothing is a sponsor of this show yeah. that we're talking about today. Um, apart from what, if there's a sponsorship message and then thank you, sponsor. Right, right. But that's not part of the gift guide. No. I haven't <laughs> played board games in a long time now. Oh, so no. I'm going to put my emphasis on, on video games. And before we get into that, I just want to reiterate how much I love the Steam Deck, which is yes. the, the I've, got, I've got one here. <laughs> Always with me. Mine's straight um, above me through the ceiling. Yeah. Okay. All right. You just <laughs> drill a big hole and bring it down. Um, uh, like the Steam Deck has just been a revolutionary device for me because I just have, I have so many games in my backlog that I just never got to because like I've got to sit down in front of my computer and yeah. and I do that every day. I don't want to sit in front of my computer for one second longer, but I want a game. And so with the Steam Deck, my entire Steam library is available and I can just sit on the couch. I can sit on, you know, I can lie on the bed and I can play games. And, and I haven't found a game so far that doesn't just adapt nicely. Once you get a little used to it, suddenly you're, I'm, I've been playing RimWorld now 
and it's the best. And I was totally against it. Now it's working on the scene. It's just great. <laughs> and was, you, you don't have to simply obsess over figuring out how to reconfigure everything to work on the stream deck because you can easily attach a dongle for USB and mouse. So like I have completely used adaptive commands for things like Carcassonne, but mm. For Minecraft, where like my brain is fully of the belief that you should be doing certain things with a trackpad and keyboard, I just use those. It's fine. I, it's fine. I think you would be surprised how if you just tough through the controls on the Steam Deck for a little while, it'll start to make sense. And suddenly you won't want to go back to a mouse and keyboard. Like, there's a bunch of stuff that I've been <laughs> like I've been playing, as I said, I've been playing RimWorld. That is just the quintessential mouse keyboard game with caught keys and all this kind of stuff. I've been playing Stellaris, which again is just a really complicated game. And yet I'm able to play it with the with the Steam Deck. And That's then stuff, awesome. as you say, that is a lot more straightforward, then it's effortless. Um, and and if you just like you feel guilty about a large <laughs> backlog of video games and you want to get through them, get a Steam Deck. And, and you know, I I bought both of my kids a Steam Deck for their Christmas and birthday presents, which is sort of breaking the rule. But that's the one I gave. I gave a Steam Deck to each kid. That's, that's I waited. amazing. They were on sale this summer, and so I bought them, and then I set them aside. And then I couldn't wait till their birthdays and Christmas. And so I was like, here's your birthday and Christmas present. <laughs> and that's it. All right. Um, and I, yeah, and I, like, I know a lot of people get Switches, but like the games on the Switch are the killer. They're 70 bucks. Right, yes. to buy the Nintendo games while yeah. on you probably already have hundreds of games in your Steam library. And so that's why I recommend the Steam Deck. And and there are Steam Deck games that range in price from a couple of bucks to again the seventy dollars, but yeah. Steam regularly has sales, you can get things through humble bundles. So there's this yeah. level of availability of things that you just don't have the same way with with a switch um but other games shall we look at other games i for one i'm gonna go for the board games because sure yeah, yeah. i play so more total, total. board games yeah so uh, what else are you playing so so the other one that i'm playing it's called space base this is a resource gathering game where your goal is to to uh well you're a commodore of a space base and you're trying to keep everything alive you're trying to draft new ships into your fleet you're trying to do basically all the normal things you see in a sci-fi show but in the context of a game that is simple enough to play that you're not going to spend 30 minutes explaining to everyone at the table how to play the game. You're just going to sit down and talk through the instructions while you play it the first time and then just keep playing it. And the games are short enough that it's not like Arkham Horror where people are like, you disappeared nine hours ago. What happened? You you can right. play a good game for forty five minutes. It's it's just a nice turnaround and it's straightforward. No, nope. are the dogs okay? So so a f I was hoping the mic didn't pick up on them. A fire truck went by, and when a fire truck goes by, my dogs have to sing with the fire truck. It's what they do. Right. Yep. Um, all right, so well, I'm going to be talking about video games. So okay. I mentioned this briefly, but I've been playing a lot of RimWorld, of course. But I, like, I think I, I make that recommendation every year. Like I'm up to 1,200 hours of playing this game. It's so good. It is, it is, and I've mentioned this at some point, it is objectively the best video game I've ever made. And I, this is my hill, and I will die. <laughs> <it. laughs> but, but I've also been playing a lot of Stellaris. And if you're a fan of the kind of that classic like master of orion 2 is sort of like the best example of genre galactic civilizations but stellaris is the paradox version of this game paradox makes a lot of games like um europa universalis and and uh kong crusader kings so a lot of the other grand yeah. strategy games yeah but and so they've taken this approach for the classic space game where you're you're settling new worlds and you're building up fleets and you're fighting enemy 
races and you're having a grand old time. And But they do a great job of, in the beginning, they have these weird little story events where you find some mystery of, on a world or, and if you're willing, you know, each one is, has slight risk and if you're willing to take those on, you get advantages that start to snowball your empire. And then in the mid stage, there are all of these uh, ancient civilizations that are around. There are other events that, that start to happen you have to deal with. And so you, you know that you have to get yourself ready to a position where you're going to be able to take on this. And then in the end stage, there are these sort of apocalyptic events where scourge of the Promethean scourge comes in from another galaxy and wipe, tries to wipe you out. And just the base game, like the problem with Paradox games is like a lot of additional games require, a lot of Paradox games require a lot of additional parts. But I would say with this, you really don't need any of the additional expansions. The base game itself is is delightful and fun. Awesome. So Stellaris, highly recommend it. Well, I'm, I'm going to wander back to uh, board games because why not? So, so we don't have just, right, don't just your board game nerdery. <laughs> I'm totally the like, like on, on my personal wish list of like, there's the stuff you do if you win the lottery, like endow things, pay off your house, pay off your student loans. And then there's the stuff that, you know, you should only do in limited amounts. But part of my, if I win the lottery is to, to redo a room in our house with like the board game bookshelves that are designed to hold the board games mm. and a board game table and at this point i would honestly settle for the the rods you can buy to adapt the the ikea calyx shelves for board games um i'm that person i am that person <laughs> but yeah. to recommend games uh extronaut it's it's a game of solar system exploration by Dante Loretta, who was PI of the Osiris Rex mission. Wait. And okay. it's just cool because it has real science in it, including some of the sadnesses of like having to try and deal with a government shutdown. And as we keep prolonging how long it's going to be until we shut down the U.S. government again, this game just happens to come to mind. Um, alongside uh, Extronaut, we also have, well, not associated with the scientists, there is a quest for Planet Nine. It's another card game style game uh, where you're trying to get out and explore a planet that's been discovered in the outer solar systems. So if if you can't actually explore at least by a board game that allows you to dream and if you do want that i'm playing this game for five hours how did this happen experience wow. terraforming mars and terraforming venus are here to fill your evening with very thick instruction books once you figure them out they're good but the first time you play it it will be a journey you have been warned so I've got a couple of books to recommend yes. uh, that I've had a chance to interview. So one is called The Little Book of Aliens, and this is by Adam Frank. And he is one of my favorite researchers, uh, explainers, and he has done a lot of research into astrobiology and wrote up a nice book that sort of encapsulates the entire yeah. um, sort of field as it stands today and, you know, where are we looking, what are the techniques and so on. And I did an interview with him, but, but his book was great. Um, the other one is uh, City on Mars. Yes, um, that one's on my I want somebody to please get it for me list. Yeah, yeah. And that's by Zach and Kelly Wintersmith. And, and they are great because yeah. they started out going like, what's it going to be like to, to you know, when we have a base on Mars and when we have a base on the moon and, and they realize just how awful and difficult those places are going to be. And it sort of changed their entire perspective. And it's nice to see a really realistic perspective on what it's going yeah. to take to actually colonize space. Because, we're you know, science fiction has been leading us, filling our minds with a lot of nonsense. It's true. It's true. Expanse yeah. gets yeah. it pretty right. They're pretty clear on how miserable space is, but... Most uh, sure, but they not. still just how easy it is. And so the last book is called uh, Space Shuttle Stories, and this is by astronaut Tom Jones. And oh, cool. he interviewed 135, uh, or sorry, he interviewed 130 shuttle astronauts over, and was able to get stories about 
all 135 space shuttle missions. And so there's like one story for each one of the missions. And so you can, you can just get a sense and from the people who lived through it, what it was like to, to run that mission, that... run all those missions. And so if you want to learn more about the space shuttle, space shuttle story. So those are my, those are my three fresh space books, which I've read and really enjoyed. Very cool. And, and I'm going to recommend it's, it's science adjacent. I'm going to recommend uh, N.K. Jem Jemison's uh, The Fifth Season Trilogy. Currently, our planet has a whole lot of volcanism going down in places where there's live cams. Philippines, Indonesia, Mexico City, Iceland's getting ready to go boom and may have gone boom by the time you're listening to this. All of these different volcanoes going on right now, uh, it, it just felt like the right time for me to give the series a reread. It's about what goes wrong if we completely destabilize the geophysics of our world and what it is like to live on a planet that keeps becoming fairly uninhabitable due to volcanism and earthquakes. Um, this is like your favorite subject. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I am. So, so to stay on, I'm going to distract the entire audience for one moment. Go on this journey with me. There have been these amazing videos showing how the town of Grindavik in Iceland is growing a giant crack across the town. And while it's always terrible for human homes to be destroyed and for infrastructure that has been paid for to be damaged, one small thing that is br bringing me and my that's just a good narrative voice in my head joy is the crack goes through the archaeological site of an ancient viking temple which means there is a non-zero probability that the eruption will start in an ancient viking temple and if wow. you have to have a volcano going off inside of a city and you have to destroy archaeological ruins, this is how I want it to happen. That's pretty funny. <laughs> all right. Well, hopefully uh, we've given you all a new list of ideas as well as some classic standards to help uh, satisfy the, the happiness of everyone on your, your uh, wish list. Thanks, Pamela. Thank you, Fraser, and thank you to everyone out in our audience. This week, we want to, in particular, thank uh, Scott Briggs, Jim McGeehan, Frodo Tannenbaugh, uh, J. Alex Anderson, Father Prax, Bruce Amazine, Planistar, J uh, Glenn McDavid, Smansky, The Air Major, John Drake, Nyla, Lou Zealand, Scott Cohn, Marco Iarasi, uh, Georgie Ivanov, the big squish squash, David Gates, Scott Bieber, Matthew Horstman, Matthias Hayden, Justin Proctor, Aaron Zegriv, Don Mundus, Cooper, Benjamin Mueller, Peter, Philip Grand, and Cami Rassian. Thank you all so very much. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next Goodbye. week. Goodbye. And then they saved. Somebody all right. Somebody asked me. And I'm going to explain oh, for my for my question show why you always say and then they saved. Because if we don't, we will forget to save and it will keep recording and yeah. fill up our hard drives and make editing much, much harder for our editors. Um, yeah, I mean, the reason is that that's the moment of, of us saving our audio for this. Yeah. episode. Yeah. Um, so the they, they saved is that we then saved our audio and then uploaded it. So, so Drebsdorf on Twitch ask a question that I also want you to explain because it's kind of cringy. So this is for Fraser's rim world, human leather, yay or nay? Um, what a great question. Uh, <laughs> So with RimWorld, um, you can make leather out of humans. And, you know, one of the largest renewable resources you have in the late game is just nonstop people attempting to kill you. And so you get all of these raiders that are coming in nonstop. And so what you do is you, 
um, you kill them, you know, and then you have to do something with the bodies. And, and if you are willing to take the hit, uh, you can, uh, you can use them for leather and so you can make chairs and clothing out of leather, uh, for your, you know, for your colonists, but they experience a sadness. So they experience a sadness when you, uh, I guess when you process the raiders and they experience a sadness when they have to wear the raiders. So, so unless you're going full, um, Uh, unless you're going to go full evil, <laughs> like if you can get everybody in your base to be awful and then it works, but no, I, right. I, I've, I've never, I've never, I know how to do it and I don't do it because it's just, it's too much misery. Yeah. Yeah. So, but there was, <laughs> there was a great person posted a challenge, um, for, for room world where you had to see if you could make, you had to, at the end of the challenge, you had to deliver like, yeah, like a bunch of human leather hats or something like that. Oh, and the challenge was, was, was that you had to get through people just being horrified nonstop that this is what they had to do. So anyway, so no, I'm against it. Uh, so yeah, I, I just can be off can be a human rights violation so so to clear my brain of those thoughts i opened up the iceland uh meteorological uh office website iceland met office and mm -hmm. they have updated their warning to clear evidence of up uplift in svartsingi wow. uh so so it it looks like it's getting closer Wow. Ever so slowly to doing something other than just rumbling and cracking. Um, there are amazing YouTube videos where, like, people are just recording while they're uh, grabbing things from their house and getting ready to leave. And all of a sudden, you can hear magma flowing. Oh, I wonder how, yeah. like, what percentage... Like how many people are affected by the by this possible eruption? So the town is only about four thousand people. Um, they are also currently building uh, berms around the famous hot springs called the Blue Lagoon, Blue oh, Lagoon, okay. and the hydroelectric risk plant. The Blue Lagoon. Yeah. So there's a hydroelectric plant in the Blue Lagoon Resort, and they're building a berm around those. Mm. Um, the fact that Iceland builds berms against lava is just kind of metal in a way only Scandinavian countries can accomplish. They um, they did that. Did they do that before? They did yeah, it they've in, done this. In before. Hawaii, I think they've done this before. I think they did it in Hawaii, and this was like experimental. And they weren't sure that you could actually. So Iceland this out. does it on the regular. There are some amazing uh, earthworks that, that I've seen yeah. videos of. Um, but they're, they're doing what they can to protect the areas. And what's cool with Gertzvik, which is ground zero uh, for where the crack is, steam is coming out of the ground, things like that, the Viking temple that is potentially going to be it now it it is already quite damaged um but uh they they did an initial uh, just evacuate slowly and calmly and take things that matter and of course people were evacuating fast enough at that point that things were left behind including pets and they've mm -hmm. managed to go back and rescue everything including all of the sheep like they mobilized nice. a whole bunch of um they're not called cattle trucks when you fill them with sheep. I'm not sure what you call them. But they, they mobilized a whole bunch of trailers designed for moving sheep. And they moved the sheep and they got people's oh. fish tanks out. And right. um, so so today they uh, announced this morning they were going to cautiously let small groups of people in to continue doing things like getting important documents, getting photo albums. Um but they're monitoring the sulfur output, they're monitoring everything, and they're ready to just go, shoop, you're gone, uh, the second mm -hmm. things get more exciting. 
Yeah, I mean, it depends on on the kind of volcanic eruption that you're dealing with. But you can outrun lava. Like, yeah, you can't outrun pyroclastic. Right. But yeah. this is a vast flat area that uh, they're looking at. They have a 15 kilometer long dike intrusion. So if you've yep. ever flown over, um, oh, what is it? Uh, ship rock in the american southwest you can see this long completely horizontal feature across the landscape you can also see this in google maps that's a dike intrusion where ship's rock is actually the old core of a um, long eroded volcano so what they're looking at is currently the same kind of thing happening where there's a 15 kilometer long dike and they're just waiting to see where it comes up through the surface um yep. And then it's just going to basically flood the plane. So drill a hole in your front lawn and have lava come out of it. And they're doing that on a grand scale. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, I hope everyone is safe and I hope it doesn't yeah. cause too much damage because that blue lagoon is kind of close to Reykjavik. Like it's. So this it's is on the Reykjavik. Of, it's on. Kilometers. Yeah. It's on the Reykjavik Peninsula. Um, the ash will probably uh, blow the other direction if you look at the jet stream over the area. But all of Iceland isn't that big, but in general, um, much closer volcanoes have recently gone off. So this this isn't a huge scare for Reykjavik. Yeah, it is funny how different places are used, accustomed yeah. to different things. Uh, you know, for me, it is rain, torrential rain and yeah. earthquakes. Um, where I am right now in Arizona, like just heat, just <laughs> overwhelming heat waves where they were like above 110 for oh God. Weeks. three weeks or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Like bonkers. And I'm down um, with tornadoes. Yeah, and you get tornado, you have tornado warnings. So I wonder, is there like the, the place on Earth that is the, that is the safest? I wonder where that is. Probably some place that gets a lot of snow. Is it England? Yeah, no, it's, it's, could be. Yeah, the weather's fairly moderate. It's geologically uh, stable. Geologically stable. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, cool. Any other questions? Um, I am not seeing any over on Twitch. I'm on not YouTube sure either. if uh, we've had others. So then give me some recommendations and maybe people in the chat as well. So so I'm going to go to uh, the Desert Museum. 11. You need to go to the Sonora Desert Museum. Um, Desert Museum. Uh, that depends on how much kept wildlife there is. Um, Mount Lemmon Observatory. Mount Graham Observatory and Kitt Peak National Observatory. Oh, how far was Kit Peak? Kit Peak, you can actually, if you're particularly invested, you can bike ride there. So it's not that okay. far a drive. And I'm going to go to Biosphere 2, and mm -hmm. I want to go to the Mirror Lab at ASU. And there's a cute little play uh, at University of Arizona. Um, and there's a cute little planetarium on campus. Mm, okay. Um, there is a, in old Tucson, there's a cultural center that, uh, is pretty good. And it's right next to a magnificent coffee shop cafe. Um, okay. Yeah. It's, it's, it downtown old Tucson is pretty cool. Um, Crater okay, Canyon. Cool. Uh, so, so, uh, begins with a B, uh, Behringer. Yes. That's not too oh, far that's... away. Uh, maybe in gets, the scale of the United States, it. it's not that far away. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I have another question. Are you going to order an OLED steam deck? Those were announced this week. Mm, no, probably not. <laughs> that's, um, that's what I said too. Yeah. 
I just hooked mine up to a monitor a lot because I have a monitor on an arm on the side table next to um, my comfy chair in the living room and my comfy chair in my office. And so I can mm-hmm. just like swing the arm in front of me while curled up with a dog in my lap and it's joy. So it's about four hours to get up to a meteor crater from here. Which isn't the end of the world. Man, this is such it is, it is a big place though. Yeah, White Sands is I think the other direction in New Mexico. Um yeah. And White Sands and VLA are kind of on the line from each other. I've done the VLA. Um, so White Sands and Apache Point Observatory are like Apache Point looks down on White Sands. Mm, um, okay. Apache Point is the National Solar Observatory and also where Sloan Digital Sky Survey and a few other things are located. Right. Interesting. Okay. Cool. Um... Right on. Okay, well, I think we'll wrap things up then. So uh, thank you, everyone, for hanging out with us today. I hope my internet and audio and video wasn't too bad. Um, QA tonight, yes, that's the plan. And if you are a follower of the CosmoQuest newsletter, um, we are going to have a CosmoQuest gift guide coming out uh, today or tomorrow. Depends on how quickly I can get everything typed up. and uh, if you aren't following the CosmoQuest newsletter, uh, hop on over to CosmoQuest.org. Right on. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. And uh, we'll see you all next week, unless I see some of you tonight. It's true. It's true. I'll see you, everyone. Bye-bye.